哎、欸、，Hello， 各位会众，欢迎来到 R 零。那这场我们要听的演讲是呃 ，James Paper 关于卫星通讯网路的安全。那呃，这场是预录演讲，但是呢，在演讲的最后会有 Q&A Live Q&A。那 James Paper 博士本人呢，会在线上跟大家进行互动。呃，如果说有任何问题的话，欢迎在大会提供的 Slide 上提问，或者是现场举手。你可以用中文提问或英文提问。那如果用中文提问的话呢，我会帮大家翻译，呃，然后提问给讲者这样子。呃 ，James Paper 博士他之前在 Black Hat 2020的时候就已经讲过了卫星通讯安全相关的研究了。那我本身也照着他的研究去买了一个 Self Set 天线跟呃 d v b s 2的卡片。但是呢，他的研究真的是蛮先进的，就是我还是没有办法重重复他做的事情。那今天，呃，如果说你已经听过他在 Black Hat 2020的演讲的话，今天还是会有新的收获，因为他今天要从一个新的角度去试着诠释这件事情，并且重新解释，呃，他对全球通讯的安全带来的威胁。那 James Paper 博士是美国国防部的数位服务部的数位服务专家，他去年才从牛津大学拿到了博士学位，呃，非常的年轻哟。然后他的论文是呃、uh, ，Securing New Space on Satellite、uh, Cyber Security。那这份论文呢，在网络上也可以全文下载得到。好，那我们话不多说，就来欣赏他的预录影片。谢谢。Hi, I'm James Pavor. I work with the DoD's Directorate for Digital Services. But today, I'm actually speaking in my personal capacity, mostly about research I did while I was a PhD student at Oxford. Where I studied space cybersecurity, and what I want to do today is pull together some threads from my research into space cyber to try to motivate people in the audience who might be curious about this field to get started and to get an understanding of why space security matters and what they might be able to do to help. With regards to the first point, I think it's pretty obvious to most people that space matters and. We've known that space is something special since the very early days of the space race. This quote from then U.S. Senator Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1950s really embodies this mindset of space as a sort of ultimate high ground, and this idea that controlling space gives someone influence or control of the world below orbit as well. And this has been embodied by many modern militaries, which rely on GPS and Communications from orbit in order to execute their missions, and also many modern businesses which rely on satellite data or connectivity in order to be able to maintain their kind of globalized posture. And given the importance of space, it kind of raises an interesting puzzle because there aren't any space wars, right? So to date, there have been basically no Destructive attacks against other people's satellites in orbit, and given how important satellites are and how many countries and individuals and businesses rely on them, this is a bit of a puzzle. Why is space so peaceful, and will it stay that way? In this brief, we're going to delve into that peace puzzle and try to figure out what it is that's kept space peaceful, and how cyber counterspace capabilities. Might interact with that. How cyber attacks on satellites might interact with the balance of peace in orbit. We'll also take that kind of theoretical policy thinking and apply it practically to two case studies. The first will look at an attack against something called space situational awareness data, where we'll pretend we're a nation-state actor with kind of sophisticated capabilities to compromise a key database that stores information about what's in orbit. And we'll see how that attack can mess with other people in space and how they operate. We'll also consider a simpler case study, something that can be done by an individual with about three hundred dollars in home television equipment, and how that equipment can be used to intercept deeply sensitive communications、uh, that are probably better kept private, but that are available to anyone with the knowledge to intercept them from modern satellite internet feeds. So let's dive into it and start unpacking this piece puzzle. So we'll talk about something called ASAT or anti-satellite weapons. 
and try to determine if space will remain peaceful, even in the context of cyber ASAC capabilities. And for me, I think there are three broad reasons that space has remained peaceful, despite there being strong incentives to attack other people's space assets. The first of those reasons is accessibility. It is quite hard to actually get to space. This image here is from India's anti-satellite weapons test that occurred a little while back and represents India becoming the fourth country in history to demonstrate an anti-satellite weapons capability using kind of kinetic vectors like rockets. In general, it's not just the anti-satellite weapons that can be uh, difficult to develop. There are only about a dozen or so, depending on how you count, countries that can get things into space without someone else's help doing so. So countries that have their own orbital launch capability. By comparison, it's much easier for countries to play in the cyber game. Everyone has computers, everyone has access to the internet, and they can have that kind of influence over cyberspace in order to even start developing weapons. Likewise, when we think about anti-satellite weapons, there's only a very small number of countries that have demonstrated anti-satellite capabilities, China, the United States, Russia, and India. While on the flip side, there's a huge number of countries that have demonstrated offensive cyber capabilities in some way or another. And just in general, most countries are way closer to being able to build a cyber weapon than they are to being able to develop a space program. The main reason for that, of course, is cost. The cost to develop a space program and then get that space program to a point where it can develop weapons is to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Meanwhile, the cost to develop a cyber capability, it may be expensive, you may have to hire some engineers, but it's gonna be on the scale of hundreds of thousands or maybe the low millions of dollars, nothing like a space program in its complexity to get even the best of the best vulnerabilities for your kind of cyber anti-satellite weapons. Likewise, if we think about kind of a softer policy environment as a factor that's keeping space safe, there are all kinds of reasons that a kinetic anti-satellite weapon might violate international norms. This image here is a map of countries that signed something called the Outer Space Treaty, which bans the weaponization of outer space. And while the Outer Space Treaty has all kinds of problems, I think it is the start of a legal regime that at least raises the diplomatic cost of attacking someone else's satellite with a traditional anti-satellite weapon. There is this Outer Space Treaty regime that's been around for 50 years and adopted by hundreds of countries uh, against the use of kinetic anti-satellite weapons. Well, on the cyber side, there's nothing comparable. We've got the Talon Manual, which is kind of policy guidance for the kind of laws of combat as they relate to cyber conflicts, but it's very weak and indecisive in terms of who's going to listen to it and to what extent. Likewise, states tend to be cautious historically when pushing the boundaries in space. Even when they break the rules, they often justify their rule breaking by pointing to precedent and saying, actually, it's an interpretation question. In cyberspace, many states have shown that they are quite happy to break the rules, whatever those may be, in terms of pushing the boundaries for acceptable behavior in kind of cyber attacks. Likewise, with kinetic weapons, it's very easy to know who's responsible. You can see where the rocket that hit your satellite launched from and know who to blame. Cyber weapons are very hard to attribute by comparison. It can often be a false flag kind of thing where you've got you know, strings in your malware to lead someone to suspect someone else of developing it. It can be very difficult to actually pin down whether it was a state actor or a state-sponsored actor or a patriotic non-state actor who's responsible for an attack. And this lack of attribution can make it much easier for states to expect to get away with cyber attacks on satellites in a way that they haven't historically been able to get away with kinetic attacks on satellites. Finally, there's the environment as a factor. This image here is of pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth. There are thousands of tiny objects like these 
that if they crash into a satellite, they can destroy it, random bits of metal and stuff that fell off of other space missions. And every time an anti-satellite weapon is used, it can create more debris because it hits a satellite, it breaks that satellite up into pieces, and those pieces go on to threaten other satellites. This high risk of collateral damage from generated debris really deters the use of kinetic anti-satellite weapons. You don't want to shoot any satellites because you may damage the overall space environment. On the cyber side, there are all kinds of ways that someone might debilitate or disable a satellite with kind of zero debris counter space capabilities, something like just denial of servicing a satellite that doesn't destroy it, but disrupts its ability to provide value to an opponent. Likewise, when debris goes into space, it stays there for a long time. And so the cost of generating debris can be very high. You may constrain your access to orbit for decades or even centuries as pieces of debris remain out in space threatening satellites. On the flip side, when we talk about a cyber ASAT weapon, the effects of a given exploit are often much more controllable by an attacker. And while you can imagine cyber exploits that destroy satellites, you can also imagine exploits that do a little bit less. We're going to look at an exploit that just shortens the lifespan of a satellite by wasting fuel, for example, in a way that's very hard to attribute and detect and achieves some benefits for an attacker with very low environmental risk. Finally, when we think about who cares about the space environment, basically everyone who has an anti-satellite weapons program also has a space program and satellites. And so they are particularly interested in keeping the space environment safe so that that investment in rocket launch technologies and access to orbit isn't wasted. When we flip the coin around and look at cyber weapons, though, things are a bit different. Many of the people who can attack satellites in cyberspace don't have space programs. They could be nation states or even individuals who don't care quite as much about the space environment. And so that deterrent effect that has historically kept space safe for environmental reasons may also weaken as satellites become more vulnerable in the cyber domain. So to summarize, we've kind of presented an argument here that cyber anti-satellite weapons, so hacking satellites to damage or disable them, is a threat because it uses relatively accessible technology compared to traditional anti-satellite weapons. It's difficult for countries to deter or attribute, and it doesn't have the same environmental effects as kinetic anti-satellite weapons. So this all suggests that we should expect to see increasing interest in digital counter space. To the extent that countries want to attack satellites, using cyber attacks to do so seems like one of the easier and more compelling ways to go about it. But how do we put this theory into practice? What can we actually do uh, in terms of what an attacker can get away with and what would a cyber attack on a satellite actually look like? I'm gonna run through two case studies today. The first is going to look at something called space situational awareness data, which is information that tells us about what's in orbit. And we'll see how someone who messes with this information might be able to harm the safety and security of other people's space missions. So SSA or space situational awareness data describes everything that's orbiting the Earth, whether it's a piece of debris or an asteroid or a comet or other satellites. And it's used when you're planning your space missions and picking orbits or to project whether or not your satellite is at risk of being crashed into by a piece of space debris. It's really, really important for countries to have a good idea of what's going on in space, both to protect their satellites and also to understand what other countries are up to with their own satellites to identify spy satellites, for example. However, it's also really hard to do. Space objects move very, very quickly, and they can be difficult to detect without tons and tons of radar systems and sensors and scanning satellites and telescopes. In fact, it is so expensive that there are very, very few countries that have a robust catalog of what's in orbit. 
The Dominic Catalog is run by the U.S. government as part of their space surveillance network, and it's believed to be the only catalog with really good coverage for objects measuring 10 centimeters in diameter, so like the size of a Rubik's Cube or even smaller than that in low Earth and geostationary orbits. To do this, the U.S. military has telescopes and radar systems distributed across the globe, which are constantly scanning the skies to track these pieces of debris. They even have some satellites in orbit, which are doing scanning. The next closest network is probably Russia's, which operates a space surveillance system, primarily using telescopes in former Soviet territories. These telescopes provide Russia really good coverage of certain low Earth orbits, but even Russia likely has to refer to the US information published out of the space surveillance network to really know what's going on in orbit for some smaller objects. Finally, it's worth mentioning that China is a growing player in this space. And one of the big things that China has been developing around is this idea of mobile uh, space surveillance systems on ships, because China doesn't have a lot of overseas military bases that they can use to distribute telescopes around the world. But you need telescopes in multiple points in order to do the calculations to figure out where an object is moving and kind of identify objects. So what they've done is they've built these very expensive ships, which carry telescopes across the oceans and international waters so that they can do the scanning that way. And this is kind of a workaround on one hand, but it shows also how incredibly expensive and difficult it can be to get access to this data. For most other countries, uh, they may have some limited domestic capabilities. The EU has a little bit, Japan has a little bit, but they fundamentally will have to rely on third-party data. That third-party data could come from the private sector, although most private sector companies don't have really robust catalogs yet. They're trying to make them. Um, but in practice, it almost always comes from the U.S. military, who freely shares their information through a website called spacetrack.org out of the Space Surveillance Network. And the U.S. military does this because it allows them to keep the space environment safe. It prevents collisions from happening where a piece of debris hits a satellite and damages it, and it causes a cascade where there's more debris that threatens more satellites. So it's better for everyone if the space environment stays safe. And as part of that, sharing SSA data can encourage that collaboration and that safety. Now, the data in these catalogs is frequently shared in a format called a two-line element set, or a TLE, which was a format that was designed to be printed on two 80-column punch cards. And with this very basic information, it's actually possible to understand uh, the orbit of a satellite, to understand the key properties of how a satellite is moving and where it is going over like the next 72 hours or so. This is the main format shared by SpaceTrack. And uh, while you can get better data, this is the format of data that you can get without signing any special agreements or promises with the US government. So when we think about international parties that may be relying on this data set, but don't necessarily trust the US government, uh, two-lane element sets are kind of the starting point for that data. So why would someone target this sort of data to attack a satellite? Well, the data is highly centralized, right? There's only a handful of databases in the world with this information. So if you can compromise even one of these catalogs, you can have a huge impact on what people think space is like. You can deceive quite a lot of people with relatively little access. Additionally, most users don't have any way to verify this information independently. They can't just pop out a telescope on their back porch and look to see if there's a satellite where there's supposed to be a satellite. It's actually really complicated to detect a lot of these smaller objects. And so they sort of just have to take the database's word for it. So if an attacker compromises the database, they may evade detection for quite some time. Additionally, even though the data itself is just bytes on a computer somewhere, it has really important effects for how satellites operate and how they fly. So who would be wanting to take advantage of these effects? I think there are a couple of possible threat actors who would target SSA. One are the repository owners. So the US military, the Chinese military, the Russian military, 
might take advantage of the fact that they control both the telescopes and the database in order to lie about it, to create false information that they share with third parties and cause those third parties to engage in unsafe or irrational behavior in terms of how they fly their satellites because they've been deceived. Likewise, we might think about sophisticated attackers who compromise these databases and take advantage of the fact that they could compromise maybe the sensors that feed into them or the databases themselves to start deceiving people who rely on that information. Finally, even an individual or organized crime group may find that they're able to gain access to these sorts of records, right? They're just databases on a computer somewhere and could take advantage of these centralized repositories to have an outsized effect on the space environment. So let's imagine kind of two types of goals. The first goal is where an attacker tries to conceal an impending collision by messing with the database. And this is really intuitive, right? The attacker finds a collision in the database, they change the two-line element set for the piece of space debris a little bit, and then a satellite operator thinks their satellite is safe up until the moment it collides with something that wasn't forecast to be where it is. However, today we're gonna to focus on kind of the opposite version of this attack, which is a little bit more slow burn and less likely to create environmental consequences. So we're going to imagine a scenario where an attacker looks at the data set and basically says, you know, this piece of debris isn't going to crash into my adversary's satellite, but I can make it look like it is. And the effect of that is that they're all gonna have to get up at, you know, three in the morning and rush to the office to deal with a collision notification, a conjunction alert. And they're gonna have to spend their time and their fuel to avoid this piece of space debris that actually isn't there at all, this ghost collision. And over time, this will increase the cost of their space missions, shorten the lifetime of their satellites, and allow me to take advantage of my control of this data to impair my adversary's ability to operate in space. So there are a couple of things we're going to assume as we're modeling this attack. The first is that the attacker has figured out how to compromise this database, whether that's through like a zero day in the operating system or espionage, a human intelligence officer who can tamper with the files or the sensors. It doesn't really matter all that much. For modeling purposes, we're going to use two line element sets for our conjunction analysis. So to determine whether or not an object collides with another. In practice, people tend to use more granular and precise data formats than two line element sets. But fundamentally, it doesn't really matter what data you're using to tell the lie, uh, the lie itself would be the same in any format. We'll also say that the attacker doesn't double check an impending collision. The collision is either happening too soon or the sensors don't have the capacity to vet a conjunction alert with like further sensing. So if the forecast of a orbital propagation model is that a collision will happen, the attacker will react to that collision as if it will happen. Depending on the real world practice, this is somewhat realistic for certain operators and very unrealistic for others, but at least helps get the idea across. Finally, we're going to say that any pass within one kilometer of the target satellite counts as a collision. That's the precision of a two line element set in the model that we're using. And so it's roughly how close you would expect the two objects to be before you start needing to change your behavior to avoid that collision. Now, in order to tamper a two-line element set to create a collision, we need to do a couple of things. We need to pick the correct debris object to make into our ghost collider. We need to put that object into a specific orbit. We need that orbit to result in the object being in a specific location, the location where our target satellite is. And we need it to be in that location at a specific time, the time when our target satellite is also there, so the two objects collide in orbit. This is quite tricky, especially because we're trying to avoid detection. We're not just going to delete an entry in the database and create a completely fake object. What we want to do is make very small modifications to a real object to make it look like it'll collide. So let's walk through that process of making those modifications. The first thing we're going to do is look for objects that could threaten our target satellite. So here is our victim satellite that we're going to try to create a ghost collision for. We'll model that satellite's orbit as a kind of plane that cuts through the Earth, and we'll look for debris objects that touch that plane at some point in the next 72 hours. 
for the objects which crash into that plane, we're going to see which objects, while they're touching that plane, are kind of inside this sphere here, so this area around our target satellite. And so those objects that kind of pass within a kilometer or so, actually this is about a thousand kilometers, this sphere that you see here, of our target satellite will be candidates that will try to modify. The intuition here is that something that like almost crashes into our target satellite is probably easier to make look like it's going to crash uh, with the modifications than something that's nowhere near our target. So let's go ahead and run our simulation for 72 hours. And what you'll see is as certain pieces of debris pass through this kind of zone of collision potential around our target satellite, they will light up and will kind of log how close they come at their time of closest approach to our victim. Once we've modeled our 72 hours and kind of compiled our data set of potential targets, what we'll be left with is this list here of five objects that pass closest to our satellite within the next 72 hours. Now, modifying these objects is actually a really difficult problem. It's hard to know how a change in like one component of a two-line element set will result in a change in a position of an object over 72 hours. But what we can do is use a basic genetic algorithm, so a sort of machine learning approach to sort of guess and check. And the way we'll do that is we'll define our individual as kind of these four components from a two-line element set, which describe the shape of an object's orbit, and then we will define our fitness, the likelihood that a modification to these components breeds into the next generation of our genetic algorithm as a metric of how close the modifications bring our targeted individual to the satellite that we're trying to threaten. Finally, we'll try to be stealthy. So we're gonna bound how much we can change these elements so that we can't just completely overwrite them in our algorithm and get a member of the population who's unrelated to our original object. If we run this genetic algorithm for a couple of hours, basically just guess and checking in that astrodynamic software I showed you in the previous slides, what we end up with is something that looks like this. This is an original two-line element set on the bottom and a malicious two-line element set on the top. And you can see that we were able to make very small modifications to the malicious two-line element set, which had the effect of pulling us into less than a kilometer distance from our targeted satellite. So let's go ahead and take a look at the attack. We've got our target satellite, Iridium-106, and our malicious debris will propagate for a little while until we hit that point of collision. And you'll see these two spheres are each one kilometer across, and there's pretty significant overlap between them. Now, the specifics of this attack always depend a lot on the models that are being used and the data that you have access to. But I think it shows a couple of important things about the SSA environment. So the first is that third party data about what's in space requires some degree of trust. If you're getting key data about the status of orbit, so key safety data from your satellite from a third party, you need to understand what risks you're taking when you're accepting that data at face value. We've also shown how this trust can be abused to have pretty significant consequences, whether that's concealing a collision that's on its way or creating fake collisions that raise the cost of space missions. Finally, we've seen how external verification and state responsibility for the integrity of their data can be very important in this domain. Any way to vet the authenticity of SSA data, even just a handful of telescopes or even just having access to two databases, which you compare to each other before trusting a forecast, can dramatically improve the security of these systems and decrease the threat of deception. So that was our study on SSA, and it kind of shows us at a high level how someone might mess with the orbits of satellites to cause physical consequences for space missions. But let's kind of move a little bit closer to Earth here and talk about a much cheaper and simpler attack vector in some ways that can actually be done by basically anyone. So we're going to look at how you might listen to sensitive Internet data that's coming from modern satellites. The first thing we need to do is understand how these satellites work. So here's the basic scenario. We've got a communication satellite in orbit over the Atlantic Ocean, 
there is a cargo vessel over here, which is trying to communicate to the satellite and over the satellite to connect to this Google server over here. The way it will do that is via a ground station located here in Spain. And we'll also have an attacker down here in Ghana who is trying to intercept the signal. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when a message gets sent in this network. The first thing is you beam up a request to space saying, get me google.com. The satellite is more or less a dumb bent pipe. It just relays that signal right back down to earth towards the ground station, exactly as you sent it. At the ground station, your internet service provider just sends the request over the internet as if they were connected directly on your behalf. They take the response and beam it back up to space. This takes a little while to get back up to space. Uh, geostationary orbit is really far. The speed of light isn't as fast as we might want it to be. And so you're talking about 500 to 700 milliseconds round trip latency to get all the way to space and all the way back, even if everything else in the process is perfect. Once our signal finally makes it to the satellite, we'll beam it back down to the Earth's surface, but critically, we'll do it over an enormous area. So anyone in this area can pick up the radio waves carrying our signal. We do this because satellites are very expensive, so you want to cover as much customer area as possible with your satellite transmissions. But the effect is that our attacker in Ghana can access the same information that's going to our customer in the Atlantic Ocean. And if this information isn't protected against eavesdropping in some way, it might be used by an attacker to gain access to sensitive information. So that's what I tried to do. I bought some inexpensive home television equipment and I pointed it at about a dozen satellites in geostationary Earth orbit that provide coverage over an area that looks something like this. So a huge chunk of the Earth's surface and started listening for signals. And what I found is that the signals coming off of these satellites often carried inside them unencrypted data using a protocol called DVBS, Digital Video Broadcasting for Satellites, and particularly a layer on top of that called GSC or generic stream encapsulation. Now, it was actually quite hard to understand these signals. My equipment was very cheap compared to the terminals that you'd have on a boat or an airplane. And so there were lots of errors in the data I captured. What I ended up doing is building an open source tool, which you can actually check out yourself at this uh, GitHub repository here, that basically just focuses on the easiest packets to extract from these corrupted feeds and tries to guess where IP payloads start and end in the protocol so it can extract as much information as possible for an attacker. The effect is something like this image on the right, which I intercepted from a boat uh, where a maintenance worker was talking about an issue they had on board. And what you'll see is that I was able to decode the first chunk of that JPEG image before my stream was corrupted, and I wasn't able to recover the rest of that compressed data, but I was able to get some information. What sort of information was I seeing? Well, I saw traffic from at least nine members of the Fortune Global 500, so some of the world's largest companies, traffic from six of the 10 largest airlines in the world, traffic from shipping companies, which account for more than 40% of the world's cargo capacity, from government agencies, uh, whether those be postal services or air forces, and even from regular people who might connect to satellite internet at a remote coffee shop or while on a cruise. Within the data, there was all kinds of stuff that raised concerns. I saw information that raised privacy concerns, things like this email, which was destined towards the captain of a Greek billionaire's super yacht, when he forgot his Microsoft account password and was broadcasting clear text across the entire continent of Europe. I saw information about crew members, passport data, immigration data that was being sent to port authorities when they were planning their next port of call. Likewise, there was a lot of operational technology related to these satellite networks. I saw credentials for wind turbines that would allow you to log into kind of wind turbine administration panels over the open internet based off of the passwords that could be intercepted in these satellite feeds. 
Similarly, I saw information related to nautical charts telling ships how to safely navigate through the oceans. A lot of them apparently operate over simple FTP servers on these little electronic chart display systems, ECDISs. And these systems, if you have the right credentials, you could actually just upload fake nautical charts to them and potentially cause a catastrophe for the navigation of ships. In the aviation context, I saw a lot of information from airplanes, both information that went to the cockpit uh, for things like electronic flight bags, which help uh, pilots plan their missions, and also information going to passengers for things like femtocells, which are basically miniature cell towers that you put in an airplane. This screenshot on the right here is an SMS text message that was destined to a gentleman who was on a transatlantic flight and received his negative coronavirus test results mid-flight, maybe not even knowing he was connected to a satellite network, but just connected to the Wi-Fi or the uh, LTE hotspot on the airplane. So why does this sort of thing happen? It all comes down to physics, right? So when I started talking about sending signals to space, we talked about how the speed of light isn't all that fast and it takes a long time to get a signal up to a satellite and back. The consequence of that is that certain protocols like TCP, which has a three-way handshake to start its connections, get really slow over satellite feeds. It's each of those steps of the handshake has to go through that really slow geostationary latency. And what internet service providers have done is they've built these tools called performance enhancing proxies that are essentially man in the middle attackers. They modify your TCP traffic to make it faster. But if you use something like a VPN, if you encrypt your TCP traffic from end to end, the internet service provider can no longer protect you. And so many customers I spoke to about these vulnerabilities said, we tried using a VPN, we tried encrypting our signals, but it made the connection too slow. So we decided we'd rather have an insecure connection than no connection at all. I've been working a little bit on how we might make this problem easier to solve, and I'd be really keen to get any ideas from you all. Basically, what I've been building is something called QPEP. It's a sort of VPN designed for satellite networks, which does that man in the middle TCP optimization over satellite links, and then uses QUIC, which is an encrypted UDP-based protocol over the actual space hop in order to protect traffic and encrypt it in the air while still offering a lot of the performance benefits that you would expect in long range um, satellite communications from performance enhancing proxies. Uh, it's actually available, it's open source. You can check it out and play around with it. It beats a lot of traditional performance enhancing proxies because of some unique properties of QUIC, but I think there's still a lot of work done to get this kind of approach rolled out in the real world and make it palatable. So that's the sort of networking project that excites you. I'd encourage you to kind of sink your teeth into this world of high latency network security because there are a lot of tough challenges in this space that I think haven't yet been solved as well as they could be. So what do we take away from this eavesdropping study? I think the first is that threat models are constantly changing. I used very inexpensive equipment to listen to signals that were being sent and received by very expensive equipment. And that really pulled the rug out from under some of the people I gave responsible disclosure to. They said, you know, we were aware that someone, maybe like an intelligence agency, could listen to our signals, but we didn't think you could do it with such inexpensive equipment. And it's important to know that in the long term, it always gets cheaper to hack things. And so you should never plan on security through cost as something that will last very long. If something is insecure, it's insecure. Additionally, we've seen how collecting data passively can have active consequences. Yes, our satellite dish doesn't transmit anything. It only listens to the signals we get. But if those signals contain passwords, they can be used to do things like log into wind turbines or mess with nautical charts in a way that can have some pretty serious consequences. Finally, we've seen how physicality, the physical properties of latency and long communication distances, led to security design decisions that had significant impact on the safety of these satellite communications networks. And that kind of brings me to my concluding thoughts for this whole talk, because I think if we step back and look at these two case studies, there's some very obvious themes for satellite security that come out. And the first is that physicality. Space systems are built to adapt to the environments they're in. 
whether it's because it's hard to measure uh, debris objects, so you need to share telescopes with other countries or the data that comes from them, or geostationary signals are really slow, so you need to eavesdrop on your customers' TCP connections to optimize them. The physics of space leads to security adaptations that raise security problems that don't exist on the ground, but still matter for space systems. We've also seen how there's a lot of value in walking between disciplines when we talk about space. Whether you care about the policy, how we set norms and rules for responsible behavior in space and cyber, or you care about communications or astrophysics or the dynamics of orbit, there's value in having people from many disciplines working together on space security because of the complexity of these problems and because of how space touches so many different fields. Finally, I think we've learned a lot about the value of adaptability, thinking of ways that we can take existing techniques and approaches like QUIC, an encrypted UDP communications protocol, and bring them into the space environment in order to improve the overall security of these systems without reinventing the wheel from scratch. We're getting quite good at cybersecurity. There are a lot of really brilliant people in the field, and I think if they adapt a little bit of their knowledge to space, it can go a long way. So that's it for me. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, you can always email me or reach out to me on Twitter or ask me questions after this if there's time. Thanks so much for listening and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello. Hello, Dr. Pavu. Uh, Hi. So thank you very much. Uh, for giving us this talk. Your talk was very well perceived. And uh, um, to be very honest, I have also bought a self-sat and the 6903, but I could never go that far like you. Uh, so uh, let's see if there's any questions from the audiences. Uh, okay, so while we are waiting for the question, I have prepared one for myself. So since you have mentioned uh, Iridium 106 in one of your slides, um, how do you find the iridium? Um, do you find it interesting as a research subject? Or uh, if you don't, why not? Yeah, I think the iridium network is really interesting. So there's been some really cool attacks on iridium that use software-defined radios. Um, it's easier to work with iridium signals uh, because they come from low Earth orbit. Um, so you need, like, the antennas that you need to receive them with can be a little bit like smaller bandwidth, which is useful compared to like the big geostationary satellites. But um, yeah, I think there's some aspects of like lower orbiting constellations that are really interesting to look at. For one, you have less latency. So those like speed of light problems I talked about don't matter as much in the Iridium context. But then you have interesting relationships between satellites and the constellation because um, especially when we think about like next generation low Earth constellations like Starlink, these satellites will talk to each other. So it won't just be a single bent pipe up to space and back down, but there'll be all kinds of like routing attacks um, in terms of if you can target specific satellites, make the network slower, or if you can like craft messages that get routed in a certain way. So I think like Iridium is like one of the early low Earth orbiting internet constellations is a great like start for thinking about those sorts of problems. Cool. Uh, so I've got a question from the internet uh, from Slido. Uh, so the question reads like, uh, why don't people just encrypt the data as they send through the satellite so the, these data cannot be eavesdropped? Uh, uh, I, I know that you have proposed QPAP, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's one that I've asked myself over and over again at basically every step of this process from like doing responsible disclosure to trying to design solutions. I think there are basically two reasons. Um, one is that nobody feels like it's their job to encrypt the traffic. So internet service providers will basically say, we don't have an obligation to do anything other than like move bytes from one place to another place. And if customers want their data to be encrypted, will it, the customer need to encrypt it? Meanwhile, customers will either say they have no idea what they're doing, right? So like someone on a cruise ship isn't necessarily going to know what using a satellite signal means for the threat model. Or they'll say, we've tried to use the best tools we have available to us, things like VPNs, 
But because we don't control the underlying infrastructure and protocols, those come with unacceptable performance trade-offs. So I think it's not that people couldn't use encryption. I think it's just, it's very easy to tell people to use encryption. It's sometimes harder to make people want to use encryption and then give them the tools to be able to do that. Cool. Thank you very much for the answer. And I guess the time is up. So really appreciate your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Awesome. No problem. Enjoy the rest of the conference.